Hey, thank you so much, Victoria. Uh, welcome, guys. I'm Kim Moore, the co-creator of Black Woman Be Whole. And I'm Adnisha Salisbury, the other co-creator of Black Woman Be Whole. And we are so excited to be back for day two. So thank you for joining us. We're your hosts. We love to welcome back those that attended yesterday and welcome those who are here today for the first time. So just to recap what we did yesterday, we talked about self-care, understanding the connection between self-care and relationships, as well as what it means to be unapologetically you at work. So for those who were here yesterday, now that you've had some time to sleep on it, what were some of the topics from day one that resonated with you? We'd love for you to share with those who are here for the first time today. And we are super excited to be um, welcoming the amazing speakers we have lined up for you today. So let's jump right in. I would love to introduce Dr. Megan O'Reilly, who will be talking about what it means to be free at college and at home. And as a reminder, we welcome questions. So the Q&A in the tab, in the, the Q&A tab in the chat box, please add your questions there. And if time allows, we will read them. Welcome, Dr. Megan. How Welcome. are you? Hello, ladies. Welcome. I'm doing very, very well. I was excited to be here today. It's finally here. So I'm ready to answer some questions and get into some nitty gritty of some of those statistics we heard and really just break open this experience and talk about freedom, safety, different spaces we can feel that in and just dive in with the students we have. We have people from all over the country today, so I'm excited. This is exciting and we are excited to listen to your presentation. So we want you to get started and let's do it. All right, let's dive off. in. Excellent. So I get to talk to us about both being free and safe at college and at home. These are gonna be the two spaces that you're gonna be spending or are spending a significant portion of your life, right? So what are these two spaces? How are they made up? Um, how can you maneuver the in between those two? And because they're both very different for some of us, okay? But let me go ahead and introduce myself a little bit more. Now, this is an activity I love to do with students because it kind of demonstrates these two worlds we're talking about today school, kind of the resume self, and at home, the unresume self. So let me tell you who I am in terms of the resume self, right? So here are some of the shiny titles that I hold on to that I've studied and worked hard to earn. So I'm a psychologist, took a lot of school for that. Um, I'm a DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant. I like to focus on self-worth for marginalized communities. That means how do we reclaim in a capitalistic um, society, how do we reclaim rest and not tying our worth to achievement and productivity all while being unapologetically ourselves, right? Um, I have a business, I uh, teach, I love to teach. One of the classes I teach is the science of motivation and procrastination, who here would sign up for that? <laughs> it's full every quarter, but I also teach uh, Flourishing While BIPOC, which stands for Black Indigenous People of Color. And that's a new course that I love to lend uh, some tools for. So these are all the ways that I show up on resume, right? That I serve my community um, and the titles that I hold. Now, when you uh, exit college, you're gonna have some fancy titles too and some letters and degrees behind your name. But what I think is more important than you know what shows up on your LinkedIn is what informs that, right? Who you are outside of the resume. So I like to call that the unresume self. So let me introduce myself that way as well, right? So I am a first generation Jamaican American. That means my parents are immigrants from Jamaica and I was born here in the US. I actually got to move around quite a bit because um, my mom joined the Air Force and that moved us uh, to many different places around the world, really. I'm also the wash belly. Does anyone in the chat know what that means? Any Caribbean Americans in the room? I'll, I'll wait to see if anyone knows. Okay. Someone would sign up for the procrastination class. The wash belly means you're the last child born of your parents, right? So I'm, I was it. I'm the caboose. I'm the youngest of three siblings. Um, and family is really, really big job. Savannah is, uh, uh, Shahannah is a wash belly as well. Excellent. 
Um, and that's a big piece of my identity, right? Watching my siblings go before me, watching their triumphs, watching their struggles. Then I have all these family constellation identities as well. So I'm a daughter, I'm a granddaughter, I'm a sister, I'm a wife, I'm a mother of two now. Um, I'm a dancer, I'm a writer. Um, anyone who's a Myers-Briggs person out there, I'm an ENFJ. <laughs> and I'm also a seeker. You know, that, that captures a couple different parts of my identity. And so if and when you have time, I would love to invite you to think about the resume self that you've been thinking about very much in terms of classes and degrees and which college you applied to. But I would also like you to think about your unresume self. What informs who you are? And that would should really have some alignment with how you show up in your professional and personal life. Just something to hold on to. What is my unresume self? For today, we're going to be talking about being free unapologetically, so at school and at home, and how to navigate both of those spaces. So wearing my hat as a psychologist, one of the methodologies I practice is called cognitive behavioral therapy. It looks at how you think, how you feel, and how you behave, right? And in looking at how we think, language is very important. Oftentimes the language we use sets a frame for how we think about things, which dictates how we feel, which can also dictate how we, how we behave. So I wanted to tackle today the word free, okay? Um, my colleague is about to drop a link in the chat for you to use. I wanna take us to Mentimeter. This is an anonymous way that we can see what each other are thinking and responding. So I'm gonna share my screen. Once you see that link, go ahead and click on it. I'm gonna take you to another page. And the first question we're gonna look at together is, what does it mean to be free? When you hear the word free, what comes up to you, for you, okay? Is it a word? Is it a phrase? What comes up when you think of the word free? What does free mean to you? And we will watch this in real time as, as folks answer. Okay. Let's see. Ah, one person said unbound. Mm, living for me in capitals. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Free. To be free means that I can authentically be myself without worry of feeling judged or mistreated for who I am. Thank you for that share. There's some key words here, authentic, without worry, no judgment or mistreatment. Now, moving through the world as black people, the judgment, the maltreatment, something that's on our mind constantly. Mm -hmm. No one driving my time. Yes, that might be more of a college side of things, right? You get to dictate to some degree your own schedule, no stress. Let's get a few more here. Mm, I'm loving this. Free, unfettered. Let's get one or two more. It's actually really important to think about how are we defining these terms so we can actually start to get into some alignment with this. Let's get one or two more shares. Letting go of any mental, physical and spiritual restraints. Mm. I'd love to hear more about that, but I love these domains, right? Sometimes mentally we're holding back, uh, physically. Mm -hmm. Spiritual is a very big domain that we could spend some time on in both atmospheres, home and at school. Okay. Let's do the same thing now for safe. What does the word safe mean to you? This is a very big one because safety can look differently for each of us, right? And domains fit in again. There's emotional safety, there's physical safety, there's uh, spiritual safety. Mm -hmm. What does safe mean to you? Another way to think of this is, what elements do you need to feel safe? Right? Mm. One of your colleagues is saying peace. Right, when I feel at ease, that can be an element of safety. Mm -hmm. The ability to thrive and be at peace. 
I really love the word thrive because sometimes I see what I'm thinking. And when I think of thrive, I see a plant with multiple leaves that is just growing unabound. So kind of flourish, right? Going beyond maybe what's expected for well being. Violent free, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Given the zeitgeist of the country right now, violent free is really resonating with me, right? In terms of safety, being in a space where you're not worried about harm. Okay. Any other reflections here? Okay. Let's go back to our slides here. I want to walk us through just a few more pieces that's going to be relevant for us. <clears throat> Where am I? Here I am. Okay. We've talked about free. We've talked about safety. One other thing I want us to talk about as we dive into some questions around how do we navigate these two spaces. One thing, if you know me, that I like to do is decolonize mental health. Drop in the chat if you know what that means. Sometimes just the title gets us thinking, gets us percolating on what it means. But essentially, a lot of psychological history, um, all the things that are in the canon of what we know, has been either founded uh, by white men, straight cis white men, you're usually wealthy, um, and even things of other cultures, other ways of knowing, other ways of healing have either been uh, deliberately suppressed and discarded or, you know, just moved on without um, recognition or incorporation, right? So one of the things we have to do now very intentionally is think about how do we broaden that lens? How do we bring other voices in and to make sure that we have a very robust and diverse and truer sense of how we heal, what heals us, what hurts us, and how do we return from that? So when we think about the college years, right, there's a lot of things that are happening during this time, right? Typically um, in the canon, we think of the college years as a time for separation and individuation, right? You're leaving the nest, you're spreading your wings, you are understanding who you are with your family history, but more as an individual, right? So there's increased autonomy. There's a lot of transition uh, going on, both socially, physically, identity-wise, sexuality-wise, all the different domains of life that you can have, you're transitioning in that, right? You're also expanding your mind. Hopefully you've signed up for courses that you're excited for, um, courses that maybe you wouldn't have taken that is going to stretch and grow you. So in every realm, cognitively, behaviorally, emotionally, there's a lot of growth right, and exploration. You also could be solidifying and expanding your personal identity, right? That seems about right, right? But when we decolonize this season of your life, we also get to bring in some more nuance, right? For some, it's about, it's a me season. We saw that to be authentically ourselves. And it can also be about deepening your affiliations, right? Many of you in the room have chose to go to a HBCU because maybe there's some legacy in your family or you want to deepen your identity as a person in the African diaspora. An HCBU, a historically black college, is a place where you can actually get history taught, taught to you correctly, uh, taught to you with all the nuance of our culture, um, leave with a deeper affirmment of who you are, in that identity of your ethnicity and the specificity, the specificities of that. Um, you can also be expanding your network. Sometimes the people you meet in college become the people that are your business partners, best friends, uh, bridesmaids, groomsmen. You can meet people that you journey with for well beyond those four years of college, right? And there's a yin and a yang, right? To all parts of life, right? So I want to pull in some of the bitter part as well. So um, as much as there's expansion in college, it's also a very, can be a very hard time, right? You're, some of us may be far away from our families, um, our tribe, our network that we had in, either in high school or at home. And so there's a lot of navigation. You're exposed to a lot of new thoughts and new people. Um, financially can be a burden. Uh, socially can be a burden. Finding your niche, finding your people 
even within a historically black college. So I don't want to make it seem like the movies where college is only a positive experience, right? Oftentimes there's some challenges that we have to surmount and undergo um, that we also sometimes need some support for. Mm -hmm. Let's see, there's a Kimberly saying, let us know if Dr. Megan says something that resonates with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm monitoring the chat as well. So what it can be like to attend an HCBCU. Um, sometimes it can be overwhelming to finally not be the minority in a space, uh, both positively and, and just a new experience. You can find mentors that have similar walks, uh, yes and no. Oftentimes um, when I'm talking to my friends, that have gone to HBCUs, uh, the race element kind of subsides and the class element kind of comes to the forefront, right? Because every we may all be more the same ethnically, the class is going to uh, show up more, right? So you're gonna be exposed to different ways that black people move, learn, grow, have experienced things, right? When I'm thinking about being unapologetically free and that unresume self, some of the other things I could have listed is that I'm an anime lover, I'm a sci-fi lover, and in my era, that wasn't cool. There wasn't a lot of Black people that loved that, right? So a lot of times it's going to be about finding your niche and finding your people, right, um, that enjoy some of the same things you enjoy, but also allowing yourself to be stretched by people that are very different from you and other elements, okay? So when we move from this slide, the thing I want you to, to keep uh, as you're thinking about what does decolonizing mental health mean? Well, it means that your walk doesn't have to look like everyone else's, right? To give yourself the spaciousness to have both your joys and your sorrows that will come up. You might come across students and colleagues that are glad to be far away from home, right? And doing living their best life. And you might be homesick, right? And not feeling like that's wrong or bad in any way. The emotions that you're feeling are valid and processing through those lovingly will be part of the battle, giving yourself some space, right? It doesn't have to look like everyone else's. Oh, someone else loves anime. <laughs> Let's talk offline. <laughs> so that's what that means. How do I allow for all the richness of my human experience, even if it hasn't been acknowledged by mainstream, even if it's been pathologized by mainstream? Let me give you an, an example of something that might be more culturally appropriate that has been pathologized. So we talked about this season of separation and individuation, right? That can be a very individualist culture value, right? Coming from a collectivist culture, well, I'm far more closer to my family, right? Um, used to call every day, right? Um, so someone in the field of psychology could pathologize that and say, I have an enmeshed family pattern, which means too close, right? Who gets to determine that, right? You get to discern what the, the relationships are going to look like, how they may shift, how they may stay the same. Frost year might look very different than senior year, right? When schedules and things change. What time zone are you in? What time zone is your family in, right? So be very keen and keep an eye out to uh, if your walk, how you want to show up that's edifying to you is being pathologized or minimized and be affirmed that if it's good for your well-being, step out in it and do more of it and find people that will support that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's press on. <clears throat> so I have some student questions. You uh, return to that link that I provided earlier about um, what does free and safe mean to you? There's a question in there about what most concerns you about this transition? And I'll go peek at that uh, to pull more questions. But I did get some questions ahead of time and I just pulled a few that I really wanna answer as more questions are coming in. Cause I feel like some of these questions might be on our heart today. So let me throw up the first one. One question was, what does stay true to yourself really look like okay well this one starts and it's a great time to talk about it as you're maybe heading off if you're not there if you're not at college already being true to yourself actually starts with some internal reflection right 
It's an interesting question because you will evolve and change over time. And we need to leave some room for flexibility, right? You're not the same person today as you were tomorrow, right? You, even after this conference, you might be already evolving into some new ideas and ways of being, we hope, right? So being true to yourself usually for me starts with what are your values? Have you identified kind of what your North Star is? Meaning what things bring you joy? What things do you participate in? Do you not participate in? What are the things that are kind of in the gray area that you'd be willing to try? Um, what are your principles? This comes from family of origin, from culture, but also now that you're a young adult, what do you feel like you stand for, right? What things are off limits? What things are definitely high on the list in terms of things that you resonate with and that you want, to, you want your life to be about? If you haven't yet, go ahead and jot some of those things down, right? It could be a very powerful activity to actually articulate to yourself and then to others that are close to you who you are and what you're about. What is your business about of, of managing your life, right? Now, if that's still hard for you, ask your quorum of close friends. They know. They know you pretty well. Um, your besties, your wingmen and women, even family and siblings. Uh, grandparents are a great one, too, because they've known you from the jump. You're, who are the elders in your life that can reflect back to you who you are in this season of transition? There are some bedrocks that you want to stay, that you want to be aware of. So once you have those bedrocks identified, then and only then, when you're presented with a new situation, uh, a challenging one, an opportunity, whatever it may be, staying true to yourself would look like having alignment with that, right? You can always pause and ask yourself some questions like, um, is this edifying for me? Edifying meaning, is this going to be affirming? Is this positive? Is this in alignment with things that I have enjoyed in the past? Would my future self be proud of this? That's a nice one as well, right? Kind of forecasting to the future and looking back, would my future self be proud of this? Is this something I would like to tell people that I know well? If there's hiding, there's probably some shade on it. I'm just going to be honest, right? So is this something I would share with others? Um, is my future self going to be proud? And is this in alignment with who I've been in the past, right? Is this going to grow me or is this going to harm me, right? And sometimes we don't know all the answers to those questions. But I think taking a purposeful pause is a type of maturity. Just having that conversation with yourself uh, long enough to get some discernment. We're not always going to know right off the bat, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. I see some values coming up in the chat. I value friendship, my time, communication, and compassion. This is really good to know about yourself, Adisha. Kimberly says that she values friends, um, fun. Let's not forget fun. Um, and she can also be intense. That's good to know about yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Let me see if I see a few more. Mm -hmm. Very good. Mm -hmm. So let's just take that for example. If you value your time, when it's time to think about classes and extracurriculars, you might not want to stretch yourself too thin like I did my first year of college and felt really kind of over, overwhelmed and like I was doing something wrong, right? How much time is each thing gonna take? And if I value savoring my time and taking my time with things that are most important, maybe we don't get too involved the first year, right? Communication's a big one. You're gonna be exposed to a lot of new people, hopefully, making new friends and new associations and affiliations. Who are the people that communicate clearly? Or do you wanna get involved either platonically or romantically with someone who can't communicate, right? That would be maybe an orange turning red flag that maybe this isn't going to be uh, edifying to my time, right? So these values really do become your North Star, okay? Let me tackle one more pre-question and then I'll go and take a look at if we have some uh, in the moment questions. <clears throat> this one was, if you don't know the area or anyone from that space, how do you identify safe spaces? Okay. This is why we asked ourselves, what does safety mean to me? What, does, what are the elements of feeling safe that need to be present for me to feel that way? Okay. That will help you with this question. 
additionally, it's really great to look at usually the long list of student groups that are at a university. And knowing your values, knowing how you like to spend your time, you might see groups already existing that speak to you, right? Um, for me, it was salsa cl uh, dance class. Uh, it was also Black Stage that put on Black plays that centered Black characters and Black themes. Um, if you have a, a theater bug in you, um, let's say it's something else in a, either an academic field, or it could be a sport, or it could be a sorority or fraternity, right? And so safe spaces are going to almost call to you, right? Uh, the people in it you might vibe with, the mission and vision of the group you might vibe with, that could be part of a safe space. So ideologically, it fits with you. But then there's also the physical space, right? Where are the spots on campus that are maybe quiet or have a good view? or are central so you don't feel too isolated. I like to say trust your nervous system. So if you're in a space and you feel agitated or you're always looking over your shoulder, that might not be your space, right? But also to pay attention to the spaces where your shoulders drop and your jaw unclenches and you kind of let your hair down and you find yourself lounging a little bit and relaxing. Uh, a lot of campuses have a black student union or multiple black student groups that might be more politically active or socially active or um, any different type of consciousness, be it environment or others, those might be some safe spaces. But I will also say on this one, hopefully you can make where you live, your dorm room, your apartment, um, even if you're still at home, making that space a safe space, right? What do you might need to have in there? Uh, maybe trinkets from home or card from grandma or letter or note. What do you need to feel connected, calm, authentic? All those words that we saw people saying in the chat are things that you can imbue into a space to make it feel safe. But we also have some ideas on what the space might already need to have to feel safe. Let me look now to see if we have any questions coming in on what is on your heart or mind today. I don't see any in the Mentimeter, so I will look here in the chat as people are sounding off. Okay. Oh, bands. Yes, I was in marching band in high school. Didn't get to join in college, but HBCU bands. Yes, football games. The, the, the music, the sound. I wasn't really there for the football. I was there for halftime. Um, but that could be a very fun, rewarding, replenishing safe space. Mm -hmm. okay. Also, Kimberly says, I need to be with people who it's okay with me being silly. Right. So knowing that the different parts of yourself that need to be seen, that need to be uh, in participation and made room for. Right. We don't want people who are too serious all the time. Right. That silly, goofy part of you. We love it. We're here for it. Mm -hmm. Let's do another uh, question that came in before our time. <clears throat> mm -hmm. How can you use your time away from home to become closer to your loved ones? Okay, this strikes me as a very collectivist culture question, right? If you're gonna be away, how do I stay connected? Well, I do a lot of counseling for students, undergrad and graduate students, some of which who have gone abroad and wanna know how to stay connected. And I think the pandemic has taught us that even if we cannot be in proximity, there are savvy ways that we can stay connected, both through technology and through other intentional ways. So for this question, this person is saying, how do I come become closer to my loved ones, right? Sometimes when we're living in the same house, we kind of take the people we're with for granted because we're gonna see them every day. And so when you're away, you might actually start missing them more or just those little trinkets, those little moments of connectivity that you don't have anymore, right? So if you have the, the availability and the pre-thought, you can actually talk to this person, be it a parent, a sibling, uh, a friend that's still gonna be uh, far away, and talk to them about what is their favorite mean of, means of communication. Some people are call people, 
Some people are text people and you need to know who's who, right? Because they're not going to pick up and if they're text people and that might feel a little wounding, right? So ask them, what, how do you want to stay in touch? Right? We've all learned how to be savvy on Zoom, right? Some people you might want to have a once a month actually see their face type of call, right? But I would say to answer this question, answer it first with yourself. Who are the people? I would say top three. Um, if it's a list of people that might be unrealistic, given you don't know what the time commitment's going to be. But who are the top three people I definitely want to stay in contact with? And how, what kind of contact do I have capacity for? Right. And then talk to them about how they like to be received and then schedule it out. You'll find that actually having a schedule gives you the experience of free time. Right. I know that might seem a little paradoxical. But the more you know where things are going to fall, the more you know where the open spaces are. If we just kind of walk into your life without a schedule, you actually waste more time. Right? That's something from the science of procrastination and motivation. So give yourself a sketch and then tweak it as you have need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK, that's that question. Let's look at the last one that I had coming in before time. How can you maintain your true self, uh, your true sense of self in regard to morals and principles while being surrounded by new influences? This is a great one. I'm going to have y'all sound off in the chat first, and then I'll give my ideas. Right. So how do you keep and maintain a true sense of self, specifically this time in regards to morals and principles, some of those values we talked about? while being surrounded by new influences. I feel like this person who provided this question, this scholar is saying, you know, how do I deal with peer pressure essentially? Or how do I have that college life um, that might not fit completely with some of my personal values and morals, right? How do I stay social if people are doing things I don't really get down with? So what do y'all think? How do you stay, how do you keep a true sense of self? I guarantee something under this umbrella will come up over your time. Mm -hmm. right. Be it drinking, other recreational drugs, sexual activity, cheating, or, you know, sharing answers. Um, I'm an old soul, so I don't know about this chat IG thing, but it sounds like <laughs> it's a slippery slope. Mm -hmm. Okay, Vanessa. Hmm, meditation. I love this response. Listening to this response in the chat about meditation, oh, boundaries. But thinking about meditation, it's a stillness that will help you ground with yourself and your inner voice um, and help you get more discerning about what you want to participate in and what you don't and why. Right? So having a meditation practice, which can look different for a lot of us, could be that place that we return to that gives us clarity. Thank you for that. Okay. Boundaries. Let's get into it. Mm -hmm. Real quick, a lot of times people misperceive boundaries as policing people, telling people what they can and can't do. Boundaries are actually a loving invitation to help people access you. You're saying, here's the door. Here's what I accept in terms of treatment or behavior or how you talk to me. And I'm going to lovingly say no on some things and pass and say yes to other things and stating and maintaining boundaries really help people locate you and engage with you in the ways that you like to be engaged with so i'm all for boundaries and if anyone in here is looking for support and more help around boundaries uh nidra tawab who is the expert on boundaries she's written a book too actually but her first book isn't called set boundaries find peace and she has literal sentence stems that you can use with people to help you affirm those boundaries. So I would definitely check that out. And then India says, for me, I would just ask myself, is this something I'm comfortable with? With people close to me knowing that question from before, right? Would I share this behavior? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 
And uh, Khalil is right, right? You know, sometimes compromise, we get a gut feeling. This is also decolonizing mental health. It's not a cerebral process. We're not crunching any data. We're not referring to other people. It's an inner knowing, like a wisdom or an intuition, right? For some of us in our cultures, even dreams can tell us different things about how we're navigating our life and different themes, right? So returning to that self, be it through meditation or other ways, and listening to your gut, trusting your nervous system. Does this feel good to me? Am I compromising something, right? And I guess lastly, I'll say lovingly, if you cross that line with yourself, you can always come back, right? Give that self-compassion and self-forgiveness and reaffirm something you might need to moving forward, okay? So, all right, some of us have that boundaries book. Spread the good news on boundaries, right? So I hope this has started a very rich reflection within yourself, conversation amongst yourself as you're thinking about navigating college, navigating home, speaking unapologetically about what you need in those spaces, collaborating with loved ones on getting that, and really setting your, expecting to have a very joyful and abundant college experience as you navigate challenges and continue unfolding and becoming who you are. I wish all of you very well on this journey and I want us to stay connected. So follow me on the gram uh, and you can check out my website if you uh, are needing any of those resources that are there. But it was an honor to start this conversation and I hope you guys keep it going. All right, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Hey guys. So thank you again, Dr. Megan, for your workshop. And you can also find Dr. Megan in the speaker bios, more information, and also at Dr. Megan on IG. Um, and we really want to thank you for helping us think more about what it means to be free and what it means to be safe. So thank you so much for that. And I do have the book. <laughs> so if you guys want to know what it looks like, definitely get out to the library somewhere, Amazon, and get the book. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And we're also going to take a five minute break. And so we will be back at 4.50 and we will continue with more amazing workshops. So we will see you guys in five minutes. See you soon.